Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Christina Nosti, Events and Marketing Director at Books and Books in Miami, Florida. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual evening with Dan Egan to discuss the devil's element, phosphorus and a world out of balance, published by our friends at Norton. Dan Egan is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. He is a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Cynthia Barnett, an award-winning environmental journalist who has reported on water and climate change around the world. Her latest book, The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans, was named one of the top science books of 2021 by NPR's Science Friday. Barnett is also the author of Rain, A Natural and Cultural History, long listed for the National Book Award. Her previous books are Blue Revolution, On Making America's Water Crisis, and Mirage, Florida and the Vanishing Water of the Eastern U.S. Throughout this broadcast, please remember to post your questions for the speakers using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And thank you for purchasing your copy of The Devil's Element from Books and Books and for supporting independent bookstores everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. 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 One of you has an open tab. Is it me? It might be you. Let's see, Cynthia. Hmm. Oh, it. Yeah, it's you. Do you have an open tab on your computer? Maybe you open twice when you open the email. You opened it up twice. Let's see. Let's try it now. How's Can that? You? Much better. Okay. I go. was the one blasting into the universe. Sorry about that. I think it sounded um, cool. <laughs> and I have this crazy, I'm in a hotel room in Boca Raton, and I have this crazy um, piece of artwork behind me that reminds me of the incredible cover of The Devil's Element. So welcome, everyone. Um Books and books, thank you so much for all you do for authors. Christina, thank you for that nice introduction. And Dan, congratulations on this fantastic book. As I admitted to you before we we uh, had our audience, I'm I'm envious. It's just fantastic. I am um, gobsmacked by your storytelling in a book about a chemical element. I mean, it's just really Thank dramatic you. and, and well-written. And I, I just wanted to ask you to start by telling us about the title, The Devil's Element. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what the they've called phosphorus for hundreds of years and for a couple of reasons. One is it was the 13th element discovered more importantly, it's really dastardly stuff in its elemental form. I mean, it, it's been a weapon of war for, for a long time. In Vietnam, it was known as Willy Peep, white phosphorus. And it's so dastardly because <clears throat> when a phosphorus bomb explodes, it releases these globules that will burn through everything. If it lands on a roof of a house, it'll burn to the basement. If it lands on a person, it'll burn to the bone. And, uh, it's, it's been doing that for a long time, but it's also a miraculous fertilizer. So there's a duality there. I, yeah, reading the section about those <clears throat> globules was pretty mind blowing, but I, I guess I should, I should take us back for a moment and, and ask you to tell us what, what is phosphorus? Well, it, it, it's an element. It's, um, and why why is it so why is it so vital to life? In a way, it is life. I mean, every living cell, every every living thing on the planet, maybe the universe, requires phosphorus. There's there's no substitute for it. it it's you know people talk about things being in our DNA, and phosphorus literally is in our it is our DNA. It's it's the uh, 
sugar phosphate that makes the, the backbone of the, the famous twisting double helix. So it's essential to life. And um, at the same time, it's, it's a critical fertilizer. We need it in our bodies, but we also need to put it in our bodies pretty much every day in the form of food. So it's everywhere, but it's also something that nobody ever, th not nobody, but many people never think about. And so that's how I kind of went down this rabbit hole. <laughs> Can you talk about uh, some of my favorite parts of the book are the historic, the historic storytelling. I wondered if you could talk about some of the ways we fertilized crops before the advent of synthetic fertilizer? Well, yeah, I mean, we've been farming as a species for 10,000 years. And I think it was quickly learned or intuited that you can't keep growing a crop on the same patch of land year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, unless somehow that land is replenished with whatever the magical properties were that made things grow. And early on, and even until you know, maybe even a couple hundred years ago, we didn't know what that was. We just knew that certain things worked. And so the, the British were really good at pioneering this because it's an island nation. They had limited croplands and limited natural resources. So they started experimenting early on with everything. I mean, well, it's like blood, hair, fabric. They throw whatever they could think of on a, on, a, on a field and see how things turned out. And there was something magical and, and extremely potent about bones. And they didn't know why. It turns out it was phosphorus. But they started uh, using bones to fertilize crops. And that propelled them into some pretty dark places, which is kind of where I start. It's one of the, the, the starting points for this book. And it's dramatic. I wrote it dramatically because it is a book about phosphorus. Right? <laughs> it doesn't, it's not the sexiest topic. Uh, <laughs> when, when, like if somebody hands this a book to you for Christmas and says, oh, here's a book about phosphorus. <laughs> like, okay, thanks. I got a lot of blank stares when people were asking, what are you working on? And I'd say a book about phosphorus. And then they'd look at me like I was diagnosed with something unfortunate. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I start with like the history of our hunt for phosphorus. And uh, where, where did the, where did the British get those bones? Where did they get these bones? Well, they, to I put think in their crops? From the historic accounts that I came across early on, it was shavings from uh, knife factories, if they could call them factories back then. I'm talking like in the 1700s, 1800, early 1800s. There was the bone shavings from these knife factories and the bones were used as knife handles. And for some reason, it was like magic dust and you could put it on a crop and things would explode. So then they didn't know what it was about these bones. They just knew that they wanted them. So in 1815, you had the ba Battle of Waterloo and some 40,000 people fell in like 10 hours along with a bunch of horses. So that's a load, that's a load of bones. Right? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, most battlefields of the era, you would expect there to be some kind of mass grave or some kind of memorial, be kind of sacred ground. But the British didn't see it as sacred ground at all. They saw it as a gold mine. And um, they went back to Waterloo five, six, ten years after the battle, and they stripped all the bones from the ground, and they brought them back across the channel, and they had built these special mills to grind the bones into dust, and then they used the bone dust of their young and of their enemy to uh, grow turnips and wheat and everything else they needed to sustain the nation. It's an incredible story. And then sometimes, Dan, you write that they would just take a single bone like a spike. I think you described it like a miracle grow spike. Primitive, primitive <laughs> miracle grow stick. Yeah, yeah. There was. I mean, they were trying everything. They, they were hungry, literally. And and then um, and then I know we can't spend too long on the history. We've got to get to the modern moment. But tell us quickly about the guano, the discovery of guano, and and how that became the dominant yeah. fertilizer. Yeah. So the story of phosphorus in the modern world, modern being say eighteen hundred forward, is the story of the hunt for it. And so at first it was bones. 
And who would have thought that you'd run out of bones? But but they did. I mean, I, they weren't ravaging every cemetery, but they were going, the, they being the British, they're going to other countries and pillaging, basically, uh, burial areas for, for, for fertilizer bones. And when that played out or when that was no longer cost effective, they moved on. And that hunt took them to the west coast of South America to the, the set of islands known now as the Guano Islands off of the coast of Peru. And these islands were just mounds of bird poop, not mounds, mountains. I mean, they were like 10, 10 stories high. And what was really exceptional about that area was birds poop everywhere, but there's very few places where there's that many birds because they were following the Humboldt current up the west coast of South America because that was a nutrient rich flow of ocean water and that was fish filled and the birds would eat the fish and then they needed to poop and they needed to breed so they'd settle on these islands and normally those that bird poop those nutrients would wash back into the sea but it never really rained there so you had these mounds and mounds and islands and islands of bird poop that the british and then the rest of europe and soon the united states saw as just a trove of you know food really and so at the time, they thought that there would be no end. It was inexhaustible. You know, it's, that's the story of phosphorus. We're never going to run out. And sure enough, they ran out, surprise, in about 40 or 50 years. And then they moved on. And now chemistry is getting on board, and the chemists are figuring out exactly what it is about bones and bird poop. And it's phosphorus, along with the two other primary fertilizing components of modern chemical fertilizer, nitrogen and potassium. And actually, the bird poop had all three, but we have we have plenty of deposits of potassium, and we can get nitrogen from the air. Um, but but there we there aren't many deposits of phosphorus. So the scientists and the agriculturists of the era soon focused on certain uh, rock deposits around the world, relatively scarce, actually very scarce in a global context, and so that's what we're doing today. We are mining rocks to put food on our table. In a weird way, we're eating rock. And mm -hmm. that rock is not inexhaustible. So there's a couple, uh, there are some really big Florida angles in this book, which we should talk about given the Florida audience at Books and Books. And by the way, uh, Florida audience and and all all audience members Remember to put your questions in the ask a question tab and I'll keep checking there. And after Dan and I talk for just a little while, I'd like to open it up to questions for the audience. But there are sort of, um, you know, a big, big chunks of this story take place in Florida, one being uh, the extraordinary discovery of phosphate rock in Florida. Is that in the late is that in the late 19th century, Dan? Yeah, I believe 1890s, 1880s, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so you, yeah, I mean, once the chemists of the era realized that um, there was only certain deposits of rocks, they started honing in on certain areas. And it's basically primarily sedimentary rock, which is the accretion of life over eons often on the ocean floor and then it's either heaved onto land through tectonic forces or ocean levels rise and fall and i think that's the case of florida so they found these fossil beds which i don't think it was coincidentally uh, were atop these phosphate rock deposits and i i use the word phosphorus through the whole book even though when it comes to there's elemental phosphorus and then there's phosphate, but phosphorus is driving the whole thing. So I use phosphorus, but mm -hmm. they realized that there were rich phosphorus deposits in this area called Bone Valley. And uh, they went at it, harvesting them to, you know, put bread on the table. And they've been at it for well over a hundred years, but those rock deposits are not inexhaustible. And of course, Florida being such a popular state is always under development pressure and so you know there's there's already houses over some of these deposits so at some point there may be some tension there but that's getting a little far ahead of the story 
bones keep coming back in the story over and over again, right? Now, yeah. now we're now we're in the Bone Valley. Dan also begins the book. You you heard that he began the first chapter with history, but actually he begins the introduction with a Florida man. So I <laughs> I don't I don't think we'll give it away, Dan, if you if you tell um the story and, and tell sure. us why why did you decide to start with that Florida man? Because that gets us into the modern story of, of harmful algae. Sure. Well, um, pro tip, if you're going to write a book about phosphorus, you got to come out hard. <laughs> you know, you got to <laughs> grab the audience <laughs> because it's it's a subject, a, sub <laughs> a substance and a subject that not a lot of people think about. And so, yeah. And when you say a Florida man, when I wrote that, I was not thinking memishly. I, I was like, I wrote Florida man. I'm like, oh, hey, that's a thing. You know, like I live in Wisconsin, so I'm not, I mean, I know what Florida man is, but I, I don't live with it, <laughs> live with him every day. But yeah, so I start the, the book with a police chase. And I went to Florida, I think, three times doing my reporting for this book. And I would have gone more if it weren't for COVID, but that hamstrung a lot of uh, trips. But one, one of the trips I came back and my email is a Yahoo email. So I have to suffer the Yahoo news or don't suffer, I'm exposed to it. And there was a, a clip of um, this guy who was being chased by the police in uh, Cape Coral, right, right by Fort Myers. And um, he was speeding and it turned out he had drugs in the car and he got out and uh, made a mad dash for it. And this is all on body cam. So like here I am taking all these trips to Florida and now I'm on my computer screen getting like the opening scene to the book, which is, I guess, just the way things go sometimes. Mm -hmm. But he goes, he, he makes a run for it and he, he ends up in these neighborhoods where these back alleys aren't gravel or concrete or asphalt, but they're water, you know, they're canals. And he jumps into one of them and uh, he starts drowning and choking and gasping. And it's because he jumped into a not really water, but a pile of goo. And that goo is toxic algae. And that toxic algae is driven by phosphorus. And in this case, it was phosphorus coming from the middle of the state from Lake Okeechobee. And if I pronounce that wrong, correct me. Um, but, but that lake is kind of an incubator for this toxic algae because there's so much agriculture going on in the middle of the state that uh, the lake, which is only, it's about 30 miles across, it's round, but it's shallow. It's about 10 feet deep. And it's kind of a petri dish, I guess, uh, just because so much phosphorus comes off the landscape. And so phosphorus is a fertilizer. It grows crops, but when it goes in water, it grows other things. And in the case of Florida and many other places, it grows toxic algae. And that water, that algae, that goop makes it to the coasts because Lake Okeechobee is kind of artificial. It's surrounded by an Army Corps of Engineers dike that, you know, is always in danger of collapsing. So before the rainy season, they'll let water, use the term loosely, they'll let water loose to go to the Atlantic coast near Stewart, Florida, and to the Gulf Coast near Cape Coral and, and Fort Myers. And so these oceanside towns are hit with this freshwater algae that is not just a nuisance, it's a public health menace. And so mm -hmm. there's where I open the book. And mm -hmm. Florida really, I could have written this whole book from the perspective of Florida. You, you could have, but I think the power of the book is the global story, and the story is, of phosphorus is very much of a global story, um, and including where it was mined. And I, I loved learning about Morocco and the sand wars, too. I know we, we probably don't have enough time to get into that because I want to, I want to ask you about some of the national issues, but if we have time later, um, we could talk a bit about Morocco, if, especially if anyone in the audience is interested in that. But let's let's talk about um, the national pollution issue. So something I found, and and we, you know, Floridians are really getting used to these harmful al algal blooms and very concerned. Um, they've they've had a devastating impact on some of the coastal economies. Um, one thing I found very interesting about the book was that those very toxic alg algae blooms feel 
a bit new to us sometimes, but as you report, this was also a scourge in the 1960s and even earlier, but at that point it came from another source and that story blew my mind. Can you, can you tell us about soap? Yeah, soap or detergent. Yeah, you, you learn things writing a book. <laughs> one, one thing I learned was uh, I used to think of soap and detergent as um, synonymous, but they're, it's like the difference between a skateboard and a rocket ship. Uh, soap has been around since antiquity and detergent has really only been around since the 1940s or so. And it was only needed once the World War II war machine needed to start making things other than <laughs> weapons of destruction. They needed to, or to stay in business. So they started making washing machines and that demanded a more efficient uh, soap. So they created this synthetic soap that was not mostly, but heavily uh, loaded with phosphorus. And so there's phosphates and phosphorus, the terminology, the nomenclature, I say right out at the beginning of the book, uh, Phosphates are how we how we live with fertilize, live with phosphorus in the modern world. Elemental phosphorus is is kind of we have to conjure it. But mm -hmm. anyway, detergent is loaded with phosphorus, and all of a sudden our lakes are turning green, a soupy green, and they were calling Lake Erie America's Dead Sea because nothing really could live in it but the algae. And um, we recognized this problem early on. We didn't know exactly what was causing it. We didn't know if it maybe was nitrogen. You know, I mentioned the two other fertilizing elements, nitrogen, potassium, in addition to phosphorus. We didn't know what it could be. And the detergent industry certainly wasn't interested in having its formula being implicated. So they, they leaned heavily on the idea that it was one of the other two or something else. So the Canadians rich in land and natural resources and, you know, dismayed by the state of Lake Erie, which they own half of, they set aside these massive laboratories. They were actually whole lakes. Somebody explained it to me, like we, we started treating lakes like, uh, like test tubes because you can't replicate what happens in nature in, a, in an aquarium, in a lab, indoors. So they were, they were dosing lakes up in far Western, Northern Ontario and um, seeing what caused algae blooms and they struck on phosphorus. And so that led to dramatic, dramatic reductions in, first of all, they pretty much eliminated it from detergent, but it also led to sweeping sewage treatment uh, improvements. It led to the Clean Water Act. That's, that's basically what we got. And, so deter um, detergent, the detergent pollution ultimately led to the Clean Water Act, and that helped a lot. Yeah, it, it yeah. drove it. Yeah, that's a safe, yeah. that's a safe statement. But yeah. they left, the, they left alone agriculture because at the time they thought we're just going to plug what's coming out of a smokestack or a pipe, if not plug it literally, plug it as far as getting our hands on the the pollutants and removing them. And they thought at the time that agriculture, the pollution, the phosphorus coming off of farm fields from chemical fertilizer or manure was so diffuse and so relatively small that it wasn't it wasn't part of the fight that they were trying to win. So they gave it a pass. And now we're 51 years down the road and agriculture isn't what it was in the 1960s and 70s. And the lakes are essentially what they were in the 60s and 70s. Not all of them, but we're, we're going backwards. And it's largely yeah. driven by agricultural pollution today. So one thing that struck me about the difference in these periods, there seemed to be real political will in the 1960s when things were bad as they are now in terms of the toxic algae blooms and freshwaters. There was a strong political will to get this problem under control. It feels like we lack that now. What, is, what, what do you think the difference is? I don't know. And, you know, as a matter of fact, the, the algae blooms back then um, were, weren't were necessarily toxic. They, they've become increasingly toxic for a number of pretty complicated reasons. But, but we did have the collective will, both as a nation and as a continent, 
because we got Canada on board, or maybe they even brought us on board um, to deal with it. And what they did was they put our water bodies, our inland waters on a phosphorus diet. And like Lake Erie had real, literally a prescription written for it saying you, it's like a doctor, you must reduce your phosphorus load annually by this much or you're going to die. <laughs> and we did. And it, it um, recovered fast and dramatically, like in a matter of 10 or 15 years. In 1972, when we got the Clean Water Act, I think that was the year or close to it when the Lorax was written and Dr. Seuss was taking his cracks at Lake Erie. And by uh, 1985, some researchers from Ohio State University wrote the good Dr. Seuss and said, hey, you know, this is inappropriate now. Lake Erie's doing great. And I found some of these correspondences when I was writing the Great Lakes book. And he wrote back and said, you're right. And he pulled it from the Lorax. And if you go down to the bookstore today and you get, grab a copy of the Lorax, there's going to be no reference to Lake Erie. But there probably should be because we've mm -hmm. gone backwards. And mm -hmm. that's that's where we are now. And, you know, who knows what, you know, back then, I think what really galvanized people, aside from the fact that they didn't like living next to an essentially, it wasn't dead, but it was, it was really, it was on life support. Like, but rivers were burning, you know, and the Cuyahoga River burning in 1969. That's a tributary that flows into Lake Erie through Cleveland. People kind of lost it after that. They were like, this is nuts. We've gone too far industrially. We've got to go rewind a bit and get control of mm -hmm. things. And we did. We're back there now, but agriculture is a different beast. It's it's more complicated. It's it's a harder problem to solve. And it's also creating a tension with like, who doesn't need food, <laughs> you know? you don't want to demonize agriculture it's a little easier to like look at some kind of steel plating plant in, in you know cleveland ohio spewing lord knows what into the water and then look at a farm that's you know providing the food that was on my table this morning and will be on my table tonight and same thing tomorrow but we also need clean water and and safe water and we're kind of on a collision course here and a lot of it centers on Lake Erie, you know, so people have wondered, what's the next Cuyahoga moment, Cuyahoga River? What's the next moment that's going to really galvanize people? And in 2014, Toledo on Lake Erie in western, the western basin of Lake Erie, western Ohio, uh, some, some of this toxic algae or the toxins from the algae made their way into the city drinking water supply, which forced a do not drink order for a number of days and you know this wasn't a matter of like let's boil the water and everything will be fine and we'll we'll get this cleared up it was like you just can't don't even touch it you know don't drink it if you and don't boil it because if you boil it you're just going to concentrate the toxins so they were bringing in baby formula the they being the national guard by like pallets <laughs> because babies like everybody they need to eat and drink and it's horrifying that, you know, half a million people on the edge of the world's largest freshwater system are depending on the National Guard to bring in tanker trucks of water and pallets of beer. And, and every every bottle of water within how many miles was wiped off the shelves in the in the place that has the greatest freshwater, fresh surface water resources in yeah. the world. Yeah, the do not drink order, if I remember, came out. I was there the week that that happened, just coincidentally writing about exactly this, like what's it going to take to wake people up? But the, mm -hmm. the and I thought this was going to be it after it happened, but that's another, that's part of the story. Anyway, yeah, within through, well, the, the do not drink order went out maybe at midnight or between midnight and two or 3 a.m. And like the next day by like 8 a.m. stores as far away as Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is more than an hour, were just clear to their drinking or their bottled water. Mm. crazy. Dan, you talked about the conflict, the, the conflict being so different now in part because um, we, we often revere farmers and rely on them for food, but you, you write about non-food crops in 
the devil's element and, and particularly about corn ethanol. Can you talk a little bit about the influence of corn ethanol in this in this entire story, the yeah. growth of corn for things other than food? I like the way you refer to it as a story because that's <laughs> that's what it is or that's what I, I tried to frame it as. But yeah, absolutely. Um, the book is not a call to action. It's it's not pointing fingers. I see it more as just like connecting dots and sketching a picture, making a picture. And and a big piece of that picture is, I would argue, the folly of the ethanol mandate that we've had since the 1990s. And the idea behind it was really good. It was, hey, if we if we have this renewable fuel source turning corn into automobile fuel, we can work on, we can preserve our own oil reserves. We can wean ourselves off these international sources and it's renewable, which, you know, sounds great, but it turns out that ethanol demands a lot of energy and nutrient inputs to the point that it really is a wash or maybe not even a wash. A lot of people would argue it's, it's an environmental negative, um, when you look at everything that it takes to grow this corn, to squeeze it into fuel, to put it into our cars where it's highly corrosive and not nearly as efficient as normal uh, gasoline. But it persists, and that's because it's so politically popular. If you want to be president of the United States, you've got to do well in Iowa, and Iowa is ground zero for ethanol. Um, I, I have to. I love the way you uh, you got the comment from from Biden in the, in the book. Yeah, that, that was, was hilarious. Yeah, you, so you show up, you show up at the Iowa State Fair, and he didn't call on you to ask your question. So what did you do? Well, I snuck into the back where he was coming out of the bathroom. I was prepared to go to the bathroom. And that felt a little weird because I've been a newspaper reporter for my whole career, but I worked for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for 20 some years. And you always had the weight of a news gathering organization behind you, but now I'm just one guy and I'm kind of creepy you know, sneaking in the back. But I wanted to hear from the president, would the future president uh, himself, what he thinks about ethanol. And what's interesting in, about the book too, is it's kind of, some of it is happening, unfolding almost in real time because the day before I was in Madison, Wisconsin, and I was on Lake Mendota, which is probably the most scenic lake in my mind in the Midwest. It's at the University of Wisconsin campus. There's a beer garden behind the student union and there's just sails and seagulls and bluffs. It's just spectacular. But, but now because of phosphorus, because of agriculture runoff, it's plagued in late summer by these, it's like guacamole, you know, it's just this nasty, toxic, poisonous algae. So I was there talking to some researchers and some kids who weren't swimming. And then the next day, I live in Milwaukee, so I drove across Wisconsin, stopped on my way in Madison, and then went to uh, Des Moines, Iowa, to the soapbox, where every presidential hopeful, basically, if they want to do well in Iowa, they have to pledge allegiance to ethanol. And so I wanted to hear from these people myself, and they have this thing at the Iowa State Fair where it's a soapbox. It's a little stage, and this is early in the game. It's like 2019, well before you have your front runners, although Biden was recognized as such at the time. And so, I, yeah, I was trying to get his attention, and then I followed him to the bathroom, and uh, you know, he did what I expected, as did Elizabeth Warren the next day. They said that they support ethanol, and to me, that was disheartening, but it's a reality of politics. It's also... Um, a piece of low-hanging fruit in this in this complex equation or problem. It's we we can, if like I said, the book's not a call to action, but it is. I will, I'll, I'll call it a call to let's take a hard look at ethanol, ethanol, see what it's doing, and see what we're getting. And you want me to keep going because as far as is happening in real time from Iowa, I went down the Mississippi. I mean, not literally, I went home, but I made my way down the Mississippi. To, um, to New Orleans and to the Gulf of, of uh, Mexico and to the Mississippi coast because so much runoff from farm fields up in Iowa and surrounding states, which 40% of the corn, more than 50% of the corn grown in Iowa goes to ethanol. 
And so any kind of nutrient waste that comes off those fields goes down river and it ends up in the Gulf. And the 2019 was so wet. It was like the wettest 12 month period on record. So much fresh water went down there that this toxic algae, which is normally, it's not red tide, it's, it's blue green algae, cyanobacteria. It's a fresh water scourge, but it was thriving on coastal waters in, in 2019 because there was so much fresh water along the coast. It almost turned the coast fresh water. And so you're down there and beaches in Mississippi that summer were closed 40 miles of beach. I don't know how many designated, you know, parks were closed to the public. I, I found a guy who had bought, I think like 20 jet skis and these things are, they're not cheap. I mean, I, I was thinking he probably invested like a half million dollars in renting jet skis on the Gulf of Mexico and that he couldn't, he couldn't rent them because the beach was closed because of toxic algae, because of nutrients coming down the Mississippi from corn country. And he distilled it to me very well when he said, why am I being regulated out of business when the problem's coming upstream? Mm -hmm. I say that I don't want to regulate farmers out of business. I just think that there is a path forward and that is to recognize phosphorus as not something you use once and flush into the water. It can be used over and over and over and over again. It never goes away. It's it's magical. It's the circle of life. Yeah. yeah. And and I love I love your um the metaphor you use that this was um I can't remember if you said a perfect circle. What was the word? Um it it was virtuous, a, yeah. It was a virtuous, it was a virtuous yeah. circle and a virtual a virtuous cycle, and now it has been turned into some very straight lines. Yeah, and we cracked it and straightened it. Yep. Yeah, we That's cracked exactly it and straightened it. it. And that, you know, it reminded me of the 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 drag lines on the on the mines, um, the rows on the crop lines. It was a very nice uh, metaphor. But I but I want to take you now to the last chapter. Of, of the devil's element, which is called Waste Not. And that was a wonderful chapter and quite inspirational. And I think it's important that you do get to that inspiration at the end of this book. So there, there are solutions out there and maybe you could talk just a little bit about those solutions before we get to uh, some of the questions that are in that are in the question box, because it is it is important to give people a, a sense of, you know, realistic hope and that we we don't have to live this way, just like in the 1960s when the fresh waters were were full of were full of algae. We don't have to live the way that we're living now. Yeah, I, I thank you for liking that chapter. I kind of see it as as the link to the circle <laughs> that I'd been writing about. And it really is the need for us to recognize that we can't keep, you know, we, we live in a disposable world, but I think one of the most dangerous things to just use once and throw away is phosphorus because of the things that we've been talking about. And so early on, I was talking about the British doing everything they could, putting everything they could onto fields. And I just think about what they would have thought. I think about this now, I probably should have put it in the book, but what would they have thought when they see like a modern CAFO factory farm, uh, sewage lagoon or manure lagoon? You know, we see that as something that's toxic, something that needs to be safely removed from that water, not from the watershed, but applied within the watershed so it can be safely absorbed by crops. We see it as a nuisance that it has some some potential upsides. The, the early... British agriculturists would see that as just a downright trove. It would be like a guano island in their backyard. <laughs> and we need to move forward in thinking like that. And so, yeah, a lot of it is used as fertilizer and spread on the land, but a lot of it is spread on the land just because cows poop every day and you need to keep moving the stuff from your, from your farm onto the landscape where it remains largely unregulated, it's regulated to a degree, but obviously those regulations aren't working or the people in Stewart, Florida wouldn't be, you know, terrified about what's coming down their river. And so we're going to have to, I think it's inevitable. We're going to have to begin treating this stuff as a resource rather than as a waste. And that's going to cost some money if we're going to try to like, because a rule of thumb right now is, 
if you have to move manure more than 10 or 15 miles from the cow that pooped it out, it's a money loser. So they put it in on croplands near near the the generating farms, whether the farms need it or not. Um, but we can treat that stuff down to its elemental, almost elemental form, molecular form, and it have have pellets of manure derived chemical fertilizer, pure as anything that's coming from any factory anywhere in the world right now. And then it becomes cost efficient to move it around. So it's a nutritional trove, and we need to recognize these lagoons as such. And so far we haven't. And you know, the farmers, again, I don't want to disparage them. They're working within the system that they inherited. They'll say that costs, that's going to be a cost. But there's a cost right now to the way we're doing business. And that cost is go back up to Wisconsin, Lake Mendota, beautiful lake. There's a dock right behind the student union with a lifeguard station. There's no lifeguard up there because there's no life in the lake in July and August other than this toxic algae. And that's a real cost that isn't reflected in a ledger anywhere, but we're mm-hmm. paying it collectively. And, you know, I guess it's, if you want to simplify it all the way down to its essence, we need food and we need water. We, and it starts with water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan, I'm going to turn right now. There's only, there's a couple of, there's a couple of, um, questions. I actually see a question from one of my journalism students at the University of Florida. So I'm going to start with this one from Sarah Sowers. Did phosphogypsum come up in your research for the book? And what do you think about that waste? Yeah, that could have been its own chapter. You know, so so this book took a long time to write because of COVID. But it also isn't what it was going to be because I didn't travel to the extent that I wanted to. And we talked, I was going to go to Western Sahara. I was going to go to Guam. I was going to go to Guam because some of this algae has been associated associated with neuro, neurological degenerative diseases like ALS. And it's controversial, but it's there's a lot of smart people looking into it. I was going to go to New Zealand, which relies heavily on this uh, uh, phosphorus from Western Sahara, which may or may not be um, l- legally legitimate because Morocco has occupied Western Sahara for the last half century. But uh, I would have written a lot about phospho gypsum stacks as well, but we ran out of time. I also, it is a book about phosphorus, so you can't, you can't go 500 pages. I think the book's 240 pages. But I was blown away on my trips to Florida. I went to the Mulberry Phosphate Museum and drove down this, you know, it was a man-made, human-made valley of gypsum stacks. And I've seen what's happened like in the last year with, it was a Tampa Bay that um, got polluted by these things. These are the remnants of the phosphate mining. And it, it's it's a related issue, but it's not it's not exactly what I was getting at. So we steered clear of it. It's it's of interest, particularly right now. Um, there's a bill in the legislature that would allow at least a test for the use of uh, phosphogypsum stack material to be used in road building material. And there's a lot of worry about that. But at the same time, others argue what you argue at the end of the book is that we, we need to start thinking of this as a circular economy and reusing um, some waste. So there are very interesting arguments on, on both sides. Dan, the other question in the chat was about how long it took you to write the book. And I, I do think the conditions under which you researched and wrote this book were, were particularly um, challenging because we were in COVID and I know you have a family at home. So how in the world, how did you carry this out during COVID and, and how long did it take you? It took about four years, I guess. And, um, there was a, maybe a 10 month period where I, I just couldn't, cause I couldn't travel and I couldn't think about phosphorus anymore. I did a long project on climate change and, uh, the Great Lakes, for the New York Times, which was a, a big um, uh, time suck at that point. But 
I, you know, I have four kids and when COVID hit and three years ago, the oldest at the time was a freshman in college and um, our house was, I don't have a big house and my wife was working at home. So I retreated to um, our minivan and I wrote a lot of this book in a, in a van down by Lake Michigan. And um, I actually still, I was going to, I'm at my office at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences, where I'm a journalist in residence. And it's about eight miles from my house. And I was going to just go to my normal place of business, which is a place called Lake Park <laughs> on a bluff over Lake Michigan in, in my van. But my wife told me that that's kind of Bush League to be doing interviews <laughs> from the van. You might have been able to write the book, but you got to present it a little bit better. <laughs> so... So yeah, I was. It, it took longer than anybody expected, especially me. But um, that's working in COVID. I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of people had the same experiences. You would have looked perfectly authentic uh, joining us from from the van this evening, Dan. So there's a great question in the Q and A um, from a middle school teacher named Mary Starling down in Miami, who is asking, do either of us have suggestions for how to approach this topic with young people, such as middle school students? And I, I think that's a great and important question. And one, one thing I'll throw out um, is the idea of fossils, right? So this the, um, the the Bone Valley of Florida, where phosphate is mined in, in Florida. And that it's a very interesting story. And it's a bit of a hidden industry, right? As Dan said, it's kind of in the center of the state. It's in small towns. And it's neat to think about where this element came from. It comes from the fossils um, of the, the creatures that lived here in Florida, um, some some of the time when Florida was covered by a sea, and so you can you can bring in fossils to your classroom. That's one way to talk about how this element was created. Um, and we I've taken students fossil hunting in the Peace River um, to help them understand yeah. where phosphate comes from. Dan, how about how about and you're a dad too, so you're a great person to talk to about this. How about how about some of the rest of the story, the impact, the impact on freshwaters? How do you talk to young people about this? How do you help them understand what we're doing to the earth and, and how to help fix it? Well, you have me just kind of thinking on my feet here right now, but um, I think maybe a good way to start an adult book or maybe end an adult book is to write it as a kid's book too. And so there is something so elegant and simple and intuitive about the idea that phosphorus is not meant to be used once and flushed into the water. It's phosphorus is like the water we have on earth. It never goes away. It may get locked up in a, a raindrop, it may hit the Great Lakes and wash out to the ocean, or it may get, you know, depending on the climate at the time, could get locked up in a glacier or could end up in some kind of cesspit down in you know, steel making Indiana, who, who knows, but it, it doesn't disappear. It cycles around and around and around as does phosphorus. And that is something that I think humans are, are innately tapped into the circle of life. And so I think there's probably a ripe opportunity for somebody to, to tell this story on a page by page I don't know how long kids' books are anymore. It's been a while since I've read them to my kids. But um, it's it's really simple in a way. It's 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 so complicated in another way, but but at its essence, it's simple. And it is the idea that we don't take dead things and throw them away. We use them again to help the next generation of living things, as they will do to the next generation, and on and on and on. What what a what a great way to think about this, Dan. And and you're so right about the idea of maybe starting an adult nonfiction book by trying to open it as a children's book. So often when I'm writing some complex 
science, I will think to myself, okay, once upon a time, how would I do this? How would I do it if I just start once upon a time? And then that kind of frees my mind to think in a simple storytelling way. Um, we have a question from we have a question from Alex Harris, who's a climate change reporter at the Miami Herald. She is asking, um, she was mentioning the phosphogypsum bill in the legislature that would use that material for roads. She's saying, have you heard of people reusing uh, radioactive leftovers? Have you heard them using of these leftovers in other ways? What are some of the other ways you've seen or heard of? I haven't. And it's also a good argument, the fact that it is, you know, low grade radioactive. And then depending on the source, it has a lot of cadmium in it too, which is nasty stuff. And, you know, like New Zealand, they, they are, they, they crop dust their whole countryside. They don't just like hit the cornfields or soy fields. They, 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 dose the forests and the, the heavy metals in there and the radioactive stuff doesn't go away. It just accretes. And so maybe the best use of the phospho gypsum stacks is, a, is as a warning sign to the rest of the planet that, you know, we, we can't just wantonly dump this stuff and think there's not going to be consequences. But, you know, I don't know the nitty gritties of, of, the politics around the phospho gypsum stacks. I, I I do know that it could be a book unto itself, you know, just the mm -hmm. idea of these ponds on top of these mounds. And isn't one of them, like, if not the highest point in the state, pretty close to it? I mean, there's these artificial valleys of this stuff that there's got to be a way to reuse it and, and to make it safe to, to do so. I don't think I'd want, you know, gypsums used in sheetrock, and I don't think I'd want a phosphogypsum wall on my bedroom in my bedroom. Um, I don't know. I'm getting beyond my. my no, area. right, but, but but China tried that, right? And that was that was a problem a problem when we had uh, gypsum sheetrock. And there's a there's a question from Jean Rosenberg: Is it possible to develop a circular economy? For phosphorus, so that it would not be necessary to mine it, and that that is a very big question. And I don't I don't think Dan has the answer. But Dan, you you did ask a lot of people about the idea of peak phosphorus, and that's yeah. something that I hear about every ten years that we're we're getting to peak phosphorus and we're going to run out. So what what after talking to so many people about that, what what do you conclude? Well, yeah, you know, Florida's uh, reserves are going to predicted to play out in 30 or 40 years. And there are some in Idaho and some in North Carolina. I don't know how extensive they are, but there's this consensus that the U.S. domestic supply will play out perhaps in our lifetimes. I mean, I'm 55. So, um, you know, not that long. And then we're going to be dependent on other countries for our nutritional security, just like we've been dependent on other countries for our energy security. But there's workarounds for oil and there is no workarounds for phosphorus. So where is this headed? I think, you know, we can prolong what we have by starting to look at these manure lagoons as resources instead of waste. And we can start treating our wastewater treatment discharges. Like in Germany, this book opens in Germany with this guy discovering elemental phosphorus, and then Germany gets burned to the ground in 1943 by phosphorus bombs. And then today, or as recently as late 2002, the, the world's, one of the world's, you know, most technologically advanced wastewater treatment plants that's designed to pull almost every little molecule of phosphorus out of the waste stream is coming online in in uh, Munich or Hamburg. So it's a, it really is a paradox. We're, we're using this stuff wantonly to, uh, at the expense of our drinking water supplies, and we're also running out of it. And I just think economic realities 
if not some kind of, uh, you know, fuzzy notion of doing right by the earth, they're going to demand that we start um, treating phosphorus as something to be recycled over and over again. I don't know if that answered the question. But. It, it answered the question. Um, I think I think it's a good place to end because it sort of it sort of is the lesson of the book. But I just really want to encourage everyone on this call to um, get yourself a copy of The Devil's Element. Uh, buy it at Books and Books. We so we authors so appreciate Books and Books for all you do for us and these wonderful events that you have. I know Christina does events like every day, and we greatly appreciate it. But this book is just fantastic. And now, now Dan has me thinking of all the stories from Germany that I wish we could have talked about. But it's just it's just incredibly, it's fascinating, it's well told, and it is inspirational, and it is getting us to some of the answers that we need to fix this world. So Dan, thank, thank you, you for writing the book. Christina, thank you for hosting us and, and all the other authors that you host. And audience, thank you for great questions. You said that so beautifully. I don't think there's anything more I can add except what a fascinating conversation, how much I enjoyed it and how much I learned. So thank you. Thank you, Dan, for your work. Thanks to both thank of you. Yeah. Cynthia, for your wonderful moderating and your love of this book, which is just palpable. And uh, thanks to everyone for watching. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. See you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.